لا تأسوا لا تحزنوا إذا فاتكم أمر وإذا لم تحصلوا على مطلب ولا تفرحوا أيضا عندما تنتصروا بل يكون الإنسان دائما في حالة اعتدال في حالة اعتدال في حالته النفسية في حالة اعتدال في سلوكه في تعامله مع الآخرين ولا يجرمنكم شنآن قوم على ألا تعدلوا اعدلوا هو أقرب للتقوى لا يحملنكم بغض قوم وعداوتهم على أن تخرجوا عن طور الاعتدال والعدالة بل دائما عليكم أن تبقوا في حالة اعتدال وعدالة حتى ولو كنتم في حالة عدوان عليكم وعداوة لكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله شكرا السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد النبي الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم وتب علينا إنك أنت التواب الرحيم I'm very pleased to be in Toronto again and my pleasure increases when I see the mashallah the great numbers that we see at RIS Alhamdulillah, this is a continuous effort by the youth of Canada, and uh, inshallah, this will spread all over Canada and all over the world. I'm also very pleased to be among our uh, shiuch and uh, scholars. Why do we need so much fish? Well, you have cat food. Because somebody at one point realized, you know what we can do? We can, we can put cat food into cans and sell it to people. Now you have to wonder, what did cats eat before cat food? Because that, for me, that was an intriguing question. I wanted to find out. So I asked my Afghani friend, in Afghanistan, what do cats eat? He said they eat leftovers. I said, how are they doing? They're doing fine. <laughs> They're better off than these cats today that all have hemophilic diseases and getting cancer. The, seriously, we've got dogs on Prozac in America. And I'm not making that up. And I'm wondering, what kind of a house do you have when you have a depressed dog in it? If your dog is depressed, what kind of a house is that? Because dog, dogs are happy. They're always, they see the master and they just jump up and down. If your dog is on Prozac, Something's wrong in that house. I'm worried about the children. And if I, if I was a veterinarian, I would think you'd have to report that to social services. We've got a depressed dog at 613 Maple Avenue, and I think you should check out to see how the children are doing. No group would be able to say, my people is more important than your people. And that's a fundamental truth that was in our tradition all along but has become the central need, the central need of the 21st century, that we as the human race must overcome every set of ideas that separates us from each other, every set of religious or spiritual or nationalistic or racist beliefs that make us believe that some of us can succeed at the expense of others. In the 21st century, and for reasons that were just articulated before in terms of the ecological crisis, in the 21st century, there is only one of us on the planet. We are all one. We are all one. Our fate is intrinsically linked. And so false pride, arrogance, it leads us to takabbur. This arrogance, looking down on other people. And this divides up the ranks of the believers. The Prophet ﷺ was described as being a person when they went to Medina and they knew the reputation of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, they would say they would be afraid. And when they came to Medina and saw the circle, they say, which one of you is Muhammad? 
He said that this dean and this religion began a strange thing. It began with one individual, our Prophet And then the first believer, his wife, Sayyidah Khadija. And then those that came after him, Ali bin Abi Talib and Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, and Zayd bin Haditha, who was with him. That there was a time where there was only a few people with our Messenger So every time that we think about it, if we feel like a minority in our cities that we're living in, that how much of our Prophet felt in his time when there was only a few believers and Allah Ta'ala had put upon his shoulders a message that he was supposed to give to all mankind. Tabarak aladhi nazzal al fuqana ala abdihi li yakun al alameen al nadhira, Allah says. His stomach, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was straight, not like some of us. <laughs> and in many descriptions, by the way, and I found out that most Muslims don't know this, in many descriptions narrated by the great companions and the wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they describe his stomach specifically like this as a folded paper. They didn't know how to say six-pack. <laughs> True. He was so well built, he was so strong, that he had a six-pack stomach. <laughs> strong, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this, and I know you're, some of you are laughing out of surprise, and I'm surprised that so many Muslims who love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they don't know him. And they have uh, a very wrong imagination about him. To every single heart, to every single mind, at the end of your, the lectures, at the end of this convention, you should go back home with something which is a personal commitment, having heard these messages, and to change your life, to change your world, to change your family. There is a mess right here where we live. There's a mess right here where we work. There's a mess right here where God has placed us. And unless and until we go about the business of trying to the best of our ability, to the extent of the resources that God has placed in our hand to clean up this mess, we will never have the moral authority to do anything about that mess over there. It doesn't work like that. You can't walk over the suffering people right at your doorstep, totally ignore them, and expect that God will give you the moral authority to do something about suffering people halfway around the world. You cannot ignore the people who have been oppressed historically, Native Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and are still oppressed filling up the prisons today and do nothing, say nothing, and expect that God will give us the moral authority as a community to do something about the enslaved, the oppressed, and the imprisoned halfway around the world. It does not work like that. I was at Heathrow Terminal 4 a few weeks ago meeting a very dear friend who was crossing the Atlantic. I went for a coffee while I was waiting for the passengers to come through. And while I was in the coffee shop, I happened to notice that the cook was frying some eggs and his frying pan caught fire. He put it out immediately. But the smoke set off the smoke detector. And the smoke detector set off the security alarm and 50 armed policemen arrived. All passengers and those waiting for passengers must clear the terminal immediately. The Ministry of Fear had arrived. I said... Interestingly, most of the British civilians standing there simply refused to move. They didn't believe in the Ministry of Fear anymore. I was in LaGuardia Airport at um, Air Canada, and the agent was very nasty. She was yelling at me, and I yelled back at her. And I felt pretty good. <laughs> However, you know how it is when you kind of, you know. And when I got to Vancouver, 
I was at the baggage claim waiting for my luggage. And people were picking up their luggage and everybody's getting their luggage and going. I'm still waiting. Until no one was left but me. My luggage never came. She got even. And she sent my luggage to another city on purpose. And I learned a lesson. I have become a better person because of the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.